Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to be looking at the symmetries of graphs. We won't always be looking at actual graphs, so we're going to have to look at some different theorems to prove different types of symmetries. And so we're going to jump right into that. We're going to skip this activity, and we're going to look at these three theorems. These three theorems are pretty much what this entire lesson is based on. So it's really important to understand uh, these concepts. So let's look at this first theorem for this looking to determine whether something has symmetry over the y-axis. And basically to determine that, what it's saying there is that for every point x and y in the graph, the opposite of x and y is also on the graph. In other words, the y values stay the same, and if there's symmetry, symmetry over the y-axis, the x values are going to be the, have the opposite values. And so you can see that an example would be a parabola, where this point here, x, y, that'd be in quadrant 1. When it's reflected over the y-axis, the y value stays the same, and the x value is going to be the opposite of what it was originally. And that's our first theorem to determine whether or not something's symmetrical over the y-axis. Basically, the value for y stays the same, but the value for x is going to be its opposite. Now let's look at the next theorem. The next theorem is for the symmetry over the x-axis. And that's just stating that for every point x and y in the graph, the x and stays the same, and the y is going to be the opposite, is also on the graph. So here's an example where we have this point x, y, when it gets reflected over the x-axis, the x value stayed the same, but the y value is now its opposite. And that's the second theorem. And the last theorem that we're going to talk about is how to figure out, figure out what some, whether or not something has uh, reflection over the origin. The origin, remember, is the point zero, zero. So to see if there's reflection over the origin, that means that for each value x and y on the graph in quadrant one, the opposite is true for each x and y. So we would have the opposite of x and opposite of y is also on the graph. So for example, with this little line, this could be a cubic function, where we would have this coordinate, x and y. When we reflect that over the origin, it's going to be reflected down here. And that's now going to be the point, the opposite of x and the opposite of y. So how would we use these theorems? We're going to use these theorems to prove whether or not uh, different functions or equations are symmetrical to um, the y-axis or maybe the x-axis. So let's look to see how we do that. So let's look at this first example. It says prove that the graph of function uh, for f of x is 1 divided by x squared plus 1. We want to prove that that's symmetric to the y-axis. Well remember if it's symmetric to the y-axis, that means that each coordinate x and y, that the x values are going to be the opposite and the y values stay the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put negative x in this equation for x squared. So if I take the opposite of the x and you put it in here, does that give me the same value for y? Because this is saying that the numbers that we put in for x, we get a value for y. If we take the opposite value of x, we're going to get the same value for y is essentially what that's saying. So that's what we're going to do here. So let's write this as f of negative x. So if I put negative x in this function, I'd have 1 divided by negative x squared plus 1. Well, if I simplify that, what I end up getting is negative x, when you square it, becomes a positive x squared plus 1, which, if you notice, is the same as what we have up here, 1 divided by x squared plus 1. So that we just proved is symmetric to the y-axis. So why don't you try this one on your own? Why don't you see if you can prove that the square root of 36 minus x squared is symmetric to the y-axis as well. So take a second to, to figure that out. So pause the video and hit play when you're ready to check to see if you've proven it correctly. And here's what you should have gotten. You should have gotten that when you put negative x inside the function, remember you're going to square the negative x. And when you square the negative x, it becomes a positive x squared. But it's 36 minus that value, so it's 36 minus x squared. So as a result, we end up getting the same thing that we had originally. So this proves that that graph is symmetric to the y-axis. So let's look at this activity that we can use to be able to help us graph an equation. Because if we know if it's symmetric to the y-axis, the x-axis, or the origin, it'll help us come up with uh, the rest of the graph. So the equation that we're looking at here is this one, x times y equals 12. So to figure out, we want to figure out is it symmetrical in respect to the y-axis, the x-axis, or the origin. So let's start with the y-axis. 
If it was symmetrical to the y-axis, remember that means that if I replace x with the opposite of x, I should get the same equation, x times y equals 12. Well, obviously, if I replace x with negative x, that does not give us the original equation. So it is not symmetric to the y-axis. Let's try the x-axis. Now, if it's symmetrical to the x-axis, the x stays the same, but the y is going to be the opposite. So then I would have x times negative y equals 12. Well, that gives us negative xy equals 12, which again, that's not the same as our original equation. So it's not symmetrical to the x-axis. Let's see if it's symmetrical to the origin. If it's symmetrical to the origin, I would replace both x and y with the negative x and the negative y. And it turns out negative x times a negative y does give us a positive xy equaling 12. So that tells me that it is symmetrical to the origin. So now that I know that it's symmetrical to the origin, that means that it's going to be flipped over here and the graph is going to look something like that. So that's how we could use our uh, different theorems to determine symmetry to help us graph. Now let's talk about even and odd power functions. Well, first off, power functions in the form of y equals x squared or x cubed, so they're in the form a times x to some exponent, as long as a is in 0, if n is an even number, we can prove that all of those graphs in the form where we have an even exponent are symmetrical over the y-axis. We're not going to take the time to do that right now. That might be something that you do in your assignment. So what that tells us, if, if all even exponents result in being reflected over the y-axis, or the, yeah, the y-axis, what that tells us is any function whose graph is symmetric to the y-axis is called an even function. And so this box here tells us that an even function is going to be when we put negative x inside the function, if we get f of x as our answer, so if we get the original function as our answer, that tells us that it's an even function. So that's what it means. If you put negative x, or the opposite of x, inside the function, and if you get the original function as your answer, we know it's an even function. Now, power functions where we have an x, where as long as a is not 0 and n is an odd exponent, those can be proved to be symmetric over the origin. So in other words, any function whose graph is symmetric to the origin is going to be an odd function. So to figure that out, if you put negative x, if you take the opposite of x and put it in the function, and if your answer ends up being where the entire answer is the opposite of the original equation, that means it's an odd power function. So we're going to look at some examples now where we can see how this is used. So here it says, determine whether the function f of x equals or f maps x onto uh, 4x minus 2x cubed is odd, even, or neither. And if it appears to be even or odd, we're going to prove it. Well, I look at my exponents here, and the exponents for 4x is 1, and 2x cubed is 3. So that looks like it's going to be an odd power function. So that's what it appears to be. So if it appears to be an odd power function, then that means it's going to be symmetrical over the origin. So to figure that out, we're going to put negative x into the function. So it'll be 4 times negative x minus 2 times negative x cubed. Well, when we go to simplify this, 4 times negative x, that's easy. That's just negative 4x. Now, negative x, when I cube it, is still negative x cubed. I should have had the cube outside the parentheses, by the way. But when you cube that, it still gives us negative x cubed times negative 2 gives you a positive 2x cubed. And if you notice, this answer, so the original function was 4x minus 2x cubed. Now I have negative 4x plus 2x cubed. So that means that f of negative x gave us an answer that was the opposite of the original function. So that tells me that it is odd. So why don't you guys try this next one on your own, see if you can figure out whether this is odd, even, or neither. And if it appears to be even or odd, you're going to prove it. So go ahead, pause the video, and hit play to check to see if you did this correctly. Okay, so you should have found that it is odd, just like the previous one, because if we put negative x or the opposite of x in the function, 
Our answer doesn't end up being the same as what we had. It ends up being the opposite, just like we had in the previous example. So we get the opposite of x cubed plus 5x as opposed to x cubed minus 5x. So that tells us again that when we put negative x inside the function, we got the opposite of the original equation. So that tells us that our um, equation here is an odd power function. Well, sometimes a line or a point of symmetry may be located at positions other than the origin or the x or y axis. If the graph is a translation image of a familiar graph, the symmetry of the known graph can give information about symmetry in the image. And this is going to help us see that. So here we have uh, this equation, 1 divided by x plus 3 squared minus 7. We're going to figure out what the equations for the asymptotes are for this graph. So one way to do that is remember the asymptotes, the at the vertical asymptote is found by looking at what numbers or what number can't we use for x. Well, we can't divide by 0. That doesn't mean that x can't be 0, because if I put 0 in here for x, I'd have 0 plus 3, which is 3, and 3 squared is 9, and I could take 1 divided by 9. There's nothing wrong with that. So I want to figure out, though, what would give me 0 in our denominator. And you should be able to see that if I put negative 3 in for x, then I would have negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. 0 squared is 0 and you can't divide by 0. So my asymptote, my vertical asymptote, is going to be at negative 3. My horizontal asymptote is, well, what answer can't we get for y? You might think that's kind of tricky, but actually it's kind of simple if you think about it. Because we know that this equation here will never e equal 0. The reason why is because you can't, you'll never be able to take 1 divided by a number and get 0 as your answer. So this equation will never be 0. So if that's never 0, well, then the one thing that y would never be is 0 minus 7, which would give us negative 7. So there's no way that our equation here would end up ever being negative 7 because that fraction will never be 0, and so we'd never have 0 minus 7, which gives us negative 7 for y. So there are your asymptotes. So we'd have a vertical asymptote at negative 3 and a horizontal asymptote at negative 7. And so now it asks for describe any points or lines of symmetry. So if you think about the parent function, the parent function for this graph is y equals 1 divided by x squared. And you want to make sure that you have those memorized because 1 divided by x squared is an inverse equation where the graph looks something like this. And we can see that the original function has a line of symmetry of the y-axis. Well, that's been shifted now. Instead of the y-axis or the line x equals 0, it now has a line of symmetry at x equals negative 3. So we would say our line of symmetry is at x equals negative 3. So why don't you do the same thing for this one? Why don't you see if you can find out what the asymptotes are going to be for this particular function? And then use what we know to figure out about the parent function to figure out what the lines of symmetry would be for this particular problem. So why don't you pause the video and hit play when you're ready to check to see if you did it correctly. Okay, so for part A, you should have gotten that the asymptotes are at x equals 8 and y equals 9.5. The reason for that is because you can't divide by 0 again. So x can't be 8 because 8 minus 8 would give us 0 in the denominator. So we'd have an asymptote at x equals 8. That would be a vertical line going through where x is 8. And to figure out what the y um, asymptote would be, well, since this equation can't be 0, the answer for y would never be 0 plus 9.5 or 9.5. So you'd have a horizontal a asymptote at y equals 9.5. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. It's to describe any lines or points of symmetry. Our previous example had a line of symmetry of the y-axis in the parent function. And that got shifted to be a new line of symmetry of x equals negative 3. But that is not the case for this one. This is a different equation. This is still an inverse equation. But it's going to be just a plain old inverse equation or a hyperbola where the parent function, the uh, branches or the parts of the line are in quadrants 1 and 3 like we have here. And so in this case, these are symmetrical to the origin. So what that means is that this origin, though, is being shifted 8 units to the right and 9.5 units up. So now it's, instead of being symmetrical to the origin, this is symmetrical oops, 
to the point, and the point it's symmetrical to would now be, since the, again, the origin moved to the right 8 units, it would be a positive 8. And the origin moved up 9.5 units, so it's at 9.5. And again, I get that from my asymptotes, because if you think about what that means for our asymptotes, uh, where x equals 8 would be a vertical line like this going through where x is 8. And 9.5, let's say that's up here, that means that point that the graph would be uh, symmetrical to is now at the coordinate where x is 8 and y is 9.5. So that is our answer. So the last part of our notes here just summarizes the difference between an even power function and an odd power function. So you can throw this table down in your notes. And basically what it's doing is it tells us here in the first line that the symmetry for an even function is it's symmetric over the y-axis as opposed to an odd power function is symmetrical about the origin. And the transformation that takes place then if it's symmetric over the y-axis is that the y stays the same, but the x is going to be the opposite. Or if it's symmetric to the origin, that means that the x and y are both going to be opposites of what they were originally. So we can write that in function notation, saying that when we put negative x inside the function, you're going to get the original function as your answer, equal to f of x. Where in function notation for this other one, for an odd power function, if you put negative x inside the function, you're going to get the opposite of the original function as your answer. And here's what the graph, the sample graph would be for an even power function is y equals x squared. So we can see that's a parabola in quadrants 1 and 2. Where a cubic function, y equals x cubed, would look like this little zigzag line. And that's in quadrants 1 and 3. And all odd power functions are going to be similar to these. And all even power functions will be similar to a parabola. So that summarizes this uh, particular lesson, again, where we're just looking at uh, how the symmetry of graphs are related to um, the equations. So with that, now you should be able to complete your assignment. So good luck.